Hi, I'm so excited to start a brand new series, Ignite the Spark. So this will be a seven part series, which will be covering all the basics of Apache Spark that you need to know to get started with Apache Spark. So the idea behind this series is when I look at the industry, I see a lot of courses around Spark and people want to jump into the hands-on, they start coding with Spark, but you know, I thought like there should be a really good foundation, at least a beginner level foundation before somebody tries to explore Spark. So in this series, we have short lessons. Uh, we will be releasing one video every week and these videos will be anywhere between five to 10 minutes. And this will give you all the details you have to know before you start with Apache Spark. Uh, we will start with a brief history lesson. We'll try to see how Spark got started and then we will look at the features of Spark. We will look at the different modules in Spark and some of the use cases in Spark, all these things. So whether you're a data scientist or a data engineer or anybody who is willing to come into this place, you can know everything about the most powerful big data analytics engine out there by watching this series. And let's get started with the first video in this series that is a brief history lesson. So in this video, we will cover the humble beginning of Spark as a project in the University of Berkeley. And we will see how Spark has evolved over a period of time. We will also discuss about the different versions of Spark available. So let's begin. Okay, so the official website of Spark is nothing but spark.apache.org. And that's what you see here. Now, before we jump into the definition and understand what is Spark, let's dwell into the past, right? So when you talk about big data, right, in general, uh, one of the first products, or I should say one of the first solutions for big data was something called Hadoop. Now Hadoop is not very active today, but it was one of the first framework which used distributed computing to store and process big data. Now don't worry if you do not know what is Hadoop, no need to worry. You don't have to necessarily learn Hadoop for this course, but at least some of you might have heard about Hadoop. So Hadoop came probably back in 2000. 2004, somewhere around that, and it immediately uh, caught attention of uh, many people. Companies like Facebook and so many other companies started using Hadoop, right, for big data processing. And Hadoop had several drawbacks also, and one of the major drawbacks of Hadoop was it was very slow. Even though Hadoop was capable of processing big data, the processing speed was very slow because Hadoop was using something called MapReduce engine to process the data. Now MapReduce was designed to handle large data sets, but when it comes to the speed of processing, it was very, very slow. So this is when in 2009, a group of students or researchers at the University of Berkeley thought about a solution. You see this University of Berkeley, they have a prestigious project called AMP Lab. And it's kind of like a very interesting name because it stands for Algorithm, Machine and People, AMP, right? So there are a lot of projects which came out of this AMP Lab wing or division of UC Berkeley. And a group of researchers back in 2009 thought, hey, why don't we create a framework that can analyze big data, which is faster and better when you compare it with traditional frameworks like Hadoop. And thus, Spark was born. So Spark was created in 2009 as a university research project. I mean, think about it, right? And, and this was in 2009. The people who created Spark, the initial core member team, they tested it out so that, okay, this is able to process big data and this is pretty fast right, as in compared with Hadoop. And in 2013, what they did is they contributed or, or they donated Spark to the open source project Apache. So Spark became Apache Spark in 2013. So these group of researchers or students, they contributed the product to Apache Software Foundation. And you know what is open source, right? So from 2013, Spark is open source and it is one of the most active open source projects in the Apache repository. And starting from 2013, there are a lot of contributors who are adding features, fixing problems with Spark, and it is pretty good, right? Now, the story doesn't end there. I mean, yeah, so even today, it is an open source project. You can see the official website is nothing but 
spark.apache.org. But here is the catch. The original creators of Spark, right? The people, the students team at the University of Berkeley, they donated the project, right? Back in 2013. The same year, this group found a company called, you guess what? Databricks. So one of the common questions I always get is like, what is Databricks? Everybody is talking about it. My, my manager says he is going to fire me if I don't know Databricks. But what on earth is Databricks? Nobody knows. It's very simple. Databricks is the company found by the original creators of Spark in 2013. So they sell Spark in simple terms. Databricks is one of the prominent vendor for Spark in the sense you can go to Databricks and get Spark, but it is not free. So remember the open source Spark is free and you can kind of like uh, use it whenever you want. You can modify the source code and everything, but the Spark that you're going to get from Databricks is not free. Even though they are using Apache Spark at the heart of their product, there will be a fee. And the Databricks edition of Spark is available only in the cloud. That means you cannot install Databricks Spark on-premise, like within a server or something like that. And Databricks as of now supports all three major cloud computing platforms, AWS, GCP, and Azure. So that is why people keep on talking like, okay, I was working on Azure Databricks, you know, and people are like, oh my God, what's Azure Databricks? So it's nothing but the Databricks services being used on the Azure cloud. So the way Databricks works is you sign up for them and you need to have an account. I mean, a cloud account, let's say Azure, for example, and then you can spin up Azure virtual machines and the Databricks Spark product will be installed and then you will be able to use them. Now, from 2013, we have come a long way, right? Databricks is also very active on the open source community. In fact, most of the new features and bug fixes are contributed by Databricks themselves because these guys found Spark. They are the OGs of Spark, right? <laughs> so the best way to define Databricks might be they are the OGs of Spark, right? The people who actually created Spark. Okay, so one last thing that uh, we would like to know uh, is the different versions of Spark. So if you go to spark.apache.org, you have this option called documentation. And here you can see the latest release and the older versions and other resources. So if I click on this older version and other resources, you can see that Spark has a long history of releases starting from the very first Spark 062. And then you can see there are a lot of Spark 1 dot versions. So 1 dot is another major release. And then you can see there are a lot of Spark 2 dot versions and there are spark three dot versions as well the latest version at the time of this recording is 3.5.4 so you can see on the right hand side there is a preview release of spark 4.0 so there is only a preview but very soon we'll be getting spark 4 as well so uh, what about these versions right like why are they important and what are some of the things that we need to take care when we uh, talk about these versions, right? See, the first thing you need to understand is the different features that are getting introduced in versions. So when you look at Spark and big data processing using Spark, the most popular API that is used in Spark is data frames. Now, data frames were first introduced in Spark version 1.3, this guy here, 1.3 right and this was in back in march 2015 and this was kind of like a very uh, experimental kind of like version in fact from 1.3 to 1.5 data frames were experimental and by spark 1.6 and certainly by 2.0 data frames had become a primary fully supported api in spark sql so uh, spark 2.0 uh, came in 2016 so when we reached 2.0, data frames became, you know, uh, very stable and uh, they were fully supported as well. Now, uh, there is a feature called adaptive query execution or AQE. 
So uh, what is AQE? It is a feature in Apache Spark that optimizes query execution plans during runtime. So you write a query and during the runtime, Spark automatically optimizes the query. Now this AQE was introduced in Spark 3.0 version, 3.0.0. So that was in June 2020. And you know, in Spark 3.0 and 3.1, you had to enable this AQE by you know setting a parameter. It was off by default because it was experimental. And by Spark 3.2, AQ, AQE was greatly improved and for many workloads became enabled by default. So now adaptive query execution is considered stable for production use starting from Spark 3.2 onwards right so i mean so when you choose a version these are these are some of the things that now this is just an example i'm not saying these are the only thing you need to choose but just to give you an uh, example uh, what are the apis and when they became stable what are the new future features and starting from which version they became stable these are the things related to your project you should consider when choosing a version Right, so that's a quick history lesson and we will get into more details about Spark in the next video. Thank you. I hope you really enjoyed this lesson and if you would like to know more about Apache Spark and then gain some hands-on experience, then check out our Udemy course. I will give the link in the description below. Apache Spark and Databricks for beginners learn hands-on. Thank you.